We have some members of TAR's creative team here. Let me introduce them. Writer-director Todd Fields, the director of photography, Florian Hofmeister, and Lydia Tarr herself, Kate Blanchett. Thank you all for coming together. We're going to have a conversation about TAR. TAR, which is a fascinating and complex movie about power and entitlement and consequences. I'm going to get to all of those things, but I had this idea that we would enter into it somewhat chronologically. So Todd, maybe we could start with your screenplay. Um, a lot of viewers and some critics, I should add, have assumed that your Lydia Tarr is, was a real person in the real world. And actually she is a fictional creation of yours. So where does Lydia come from when you were writing the script? What was your inspiration for her? I'd been thinking about this character for quite some time. Um, you know, you if you're if you're a writer, you keep a lot of notebooks, and uh, but I never had any place really to put her. I mean, I when I really um, the genesis of her was really probably sitting atop a a, a media company, um, and if you spent time like everyone on this um, conversation has in the entertainment business, um, I don't think Lydia Tar would be all that unfamiliar. Uh, so uh, it was it was really, you know, a, a great deal of time just adapting other people's material and working side by side with them and uh, enjoying uh, visiting their worlds and their characters. But I had I had no place for her to to be outside that notebook until March 2020 at the beginning of the first world lockdown. And uh, Peter Kajowski and Kiska Higgs at Focus essentially said, write anything you want. Um, there was no beat sheet, there was no outline, nothing. Um, uh, and that was a highly unusual situation to be tasked with essentially writing a spec script. So um, out came Lydia Tarr, you know. Um, and um, in terms of uh, in terms of your question having to do with, you know, people believing that she's a real person, I think any writer will tell you that their characters, or, or most writers will tell you that the characters are very real for them. Having said that, uh, there's one thing for it to be real to you. There's one thing for it to be um, represented somehow, however crudely on the page. But the fact that people think Lady Tar is real is a testament to Kate Blanchett. I mean, that's first and foremost. I mean, um, you know, I'll tell you this, which is when we were shooting, and Florian, I'm sure, will second this. Um, you know, every day we'd just say, "Oh my God!" You know. Um, you know, we weren't prepared for what she what she brought to work every day. And, um, you know, Kate is not someone who's very um, fussy. She's not a complainer. She uh, doesn't wear her workload on 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 her sleeve or, you know, um, she just works and she shows up. So um, when Monica Willie and I were editing in Scotland, it was really the first time, you know, because this was a very ambitious uh, schedule for us, you know, other than the the concert hall and her two residences, almost every day we had a company move. So for Florian and and his crew uh, and Marco Bittnerasa, our, our production designer, was a huge logistical challenge. Um, so we never got to sit and watch dailies together, ever. Uh, and it wasn't until Monica and I were cutting in Scotland and very, very quickly, like the very, very first scene, the long scene with 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 Kate Blanchett and Adam Gopnik, um, that Kate Blanchett disappeared, you know, um, three minutes into cutting that scene, Mona and I didn't talk about Kate anymore. We talked about Lydia Tarr and, um, you know, essentially it was like cutting a documentary. So if you're shooting a documentary now about a real person with a very circumscribed set of rules, how fair should you be for them? You know, should you be leaning one way or the other? Um, and that was the main thing is just to try not to lean left or left, right just to be as you know unbiased as we possibly could and um and so our feelings about her changed every day you know just depending on what we brought into the room and what uh what our days had been like uh, if we'd seen it down three times the previous week or once the previous week we would have very very different reactions to to this character and for us she was very very real but again that that comes down to Kate Blanchett can I Let's... can I just step in there just for a minute? Uh, I think that's that's very nice, Todd. Thank you very much. But I, I part I'll of it. Take I, the compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but but you but you you said it there about it. You know, you felt like you were you were cutting a documentary, 
And something that was really, really useful to me was being invited in incredibly early into the way Todd and Florian were going to shoot the film. And that, that something that the, the two of you kept referring to was the sense that it was very much fly on the wall, that you wanted to feel like you were inside the rehearsal process with, with, with her and with the other musicians. And in a way, the audience is therefore, because of the way it was shot, you, they have more insight into um, to, to Lydia than Lydia has herself. And so I, I think that therefore they can they can invest a lot of their own reality from the outside world into the film as a result of the, of of the way it the character was looked at by by Todd and Florian. I mean, here's the thing, which is, you know, it's one thing to say we want light that feels true, um, whatever that means. You know, that's it, truth is um, it, is a strange brew and very subjective, but it's another thing to understand what that truth is between a cinematographer and and their collaborators and and to be able to execute that at the highest level in the most challenging of circumstances so I would agree with that absolutely um and that gave us a a way to keep a sort of objective reality with her mostly you know um because there's really only three points of view in the film uh, and that and that's the lion's share of, of of what we experience you know um and that's a very, very difficult thing to pull off. Very, very tricky to pull off. And um, and Florian did that, you know, beautifully. Let me ask a, another question about the the initial phase in the screenwriting before we move into production. Um, I I would I'm curious, Todd, as to when when you were writing, Kate Blanchett came into mind for you as a potential Lydia, and also Kate, I'm curious from your perspective. Of, when you received this script, what was that experience like for you? Is that was was there was this something like you had experienced before this particular script? Yes, I mean this is a story I've told many times, um, Josh. It's a uh, uh, yeah, I've never written for uh, an actor before, um, for very obvious reasons. You know, you're either going to be reductive for something you've seen them do before, which is um, not good for them, or you're going to be reductive with the character proper, which is probably not good for the piece. Um, Kate and I had met at that time when Kate when Kate first got the script. It had been about ten years since she and I had ever spoken. Um, we had met down in New York uh, on a project that uh, Joan Dinian and I were working on together, and um, uh, it didn't end up happening. But what did end up happening? was walking away from this meeting of saying, oh my goodness, you know, I met this formidable filmmaker um, who looks at a project holistically from multi dimensions, multi universes, um, well beyond, you know, uh, what presumably uh, one might um, naively think is their discipline, which is simply to play a role. They're looking at all of it she was looking at all of it and the way she discussed that was the same way that joan and i had been discussing it for over a year and she was ahead of us you know and that's that's a very good um first impression for kate blanchett so uh i reckon that when i sat down to write this and i'm just trying to think of who could possibly inhabit this character and, and steer this character and you know as stanley kubrick would say fool us um it was it, it you know, pretty obvious why she came to mind. And and at first I just thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. But but I couldn't get her out of my head. So by the time I finished the script, um, I was just ready to, I was so scared, you know, because I really set myself up for a, a giant disappointment, you know, and uh, uh, when Kate said yes, um, uh, I was thrilled, you know, obviously, and relieved and terrified because I thought, how am I possibly going to dance with this person? You know, she's very intimidating. Lydia. No, you. <laughs> 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 well, look, I'd, I'd never read anything like it. I don't know how you felt, Florian. I mean, obviously, there was a desire to, to, to work with Todd. I mean, when you sort of make a connection, you, you hope, oh, well, this is going to come to fruition soon. And sometimes they don't. Some think some... Some collaborations are, are slow burn, and then, and you want to find the right thing to 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 two together. And time has a lot to 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 do with that. But um, I, 
I think I was also likewise um, terrified, but um, I found it a terrifying but exhilarating read, and I had no idea where to begin. And I think that's a really, really exciting place to begin a project. I just knew that I would be in dialogue with Todd, and then Florian came on board, and and um, and Monica Willey, who was you know such an extraordinary um, editor. I'd admired her for so long, and then Hilda Gunnar here, and and then the cast, and and so it just I just thought this is this is this has a chance to be really special, and you never know whether it's going to to work or not. And and we felt like we were bungee jumping every day, but that was the I that feeling of bungee jumping, my heart in my throat. That that was that was um, the experience I had reading the script, hmm. and that that experience of bungee jumping is probably one that you seek out as as an actor with the different roles. Were there elements of this script specific things that Lydia Tarr does that you found scary in advance? Oh well, look on an obvious level. Um, the fact that she's a, a composer, she's one of the world's greatest conductors. <laughs> um, She's also a pianist. Um, I mean, all of those technical things. Um, a place like strangely, I did connect uh, with her is that she loves driving incredibly fast. Um, so I thought that's fun. Um, you know, but it, yes, it was absolutely, it was all of the technical demands that the film is so um, elegant and unusual, I think, in the way that it doesn't point to that maybe that's it's got that sort of documentary and feel verite feel is that it doesn't focus on her fingers it doesn't really like I said when I first saw it I said Todd you don't even I mean the Elgar was so electric to to conduct <laughs> you need a shot of her in there and it was, of course it was me, my vanity saying I had some really great there was some really great flourishes there was such panache in the way that I, and Angel goes, you go, hmm, interesting, and it didn't go. <laughs> I'm so glad to finally hear that. Boy, that was that was a like long time coming, Kate. <laughs> Actually, I got a um. I, sorry, I'll, I'll shut up in a minute. But I got a um an email this morning from um the my piano teacher in in Budapest saying she'd just seen the film and how how much she loved it and how as a musician it was just so inside the world of music. She took me around the academy and all of Mahler's haunts. It was fantastic as well as um, starting me on the Bach. And she said, but the one criticism I would have is, I think you should have seen your fingers. And this is Emma Shea. She wrote to me this morning. I went, yeah, well, maybe you could talk to Todd. <laughs> <laughs> the technical elements are incredibly impressive and also verbally the way you speak several languages while you're playing the piano all in one take. There's, there's a lot that we could focus on technically, but what I very much enjoy about Tar is that it gets beyond that rather quickly into a discussion and an examination of power. And so what I would put to the three of you as a question is, um, what were there frequent conversations, I think, between the three of you as to how do we best articulate this element of the story, this idea of power, its abuse, and the downfall of a person? I think, um, well, going back to uh, what Kate was talking about with um, her lovely piano teacher in Budapest, which is um, like not showing her hands, right? Like if you were going to see Leonard Bernstein sit down and play the piano at a young people's concert, it's very likely you'd be focused on his face and you wouldn't care about his hands because you know he can play. And so really the, the operative phrase for uh, for us, uh, there were many, um, one that Florian had that I, I've adopted personally called uh, let's not put a hat on a hat. Um, and my yes. let's, let's throw it away or let's not make it too pretty or let's not point, you know? Um, and I think that that in large part uh, creates a potential opportunity for the audience to come and engage in the manner in which, which you're talking about, you know, um, just try not to lead people. Uh, this was a, a, you know, this is not, this is not a classical music film, you know, that's the milieu it's set upon. It's a hierarchy. It's a, and a very particular cultural bureaucracy that, that must be serviced and must be fed. But it's also um, an opportunity to look at the transactions that happen, the, the two-way streets, the, 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 the clover leaves, the, the, just how dense a power structure is for someone to sit atop it. Uh, they're served. It's a, it's, it's the same thing as, you know, going back to Elizabethan times at court. There, there is a, 
there's a very clear line of ascension and dissension in terms of who benefits from power and 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 why they serve you know whatever um so that's what we wanted to walk around and to walk around that properly um it seemed like a sensible idea to, to allow the audience to be sitting in that room with us as much as possible mm. which very much feeds into your aesthetic for the cinematography i love that idea of let's not put a hat on a hat i think i'm going to use that another thing about tar that i very much enjoy is the fact that it is often a process film we're watching the development of Mahler's fifth we're watching the development of an expression of a symphony and so Florian, a question to you. Um, shooting an orchestra, filming an orchestra, has been done so many times. How did you how did you make that fresh, or how did you enter into that challenge um, with the goal of of doing something different and unique for this film? Well, I think the intention was never, you know, consciously to be different in that way. I think that you know, um, uh, first of all, I, I really want to thank both of you. <laughs> Todd and Kate, of uh, 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 feeding me into your beautiful conversation. In a way, the way this flows really reminds me of these times we had together. And I would just sit there and I would just listen, listen to you guys. And it was, uh, it still gives me <clears throat> tremendous joy to feel, to be present when you both engage in such beautiful manner. Um, so the intent is not to be different, you know, as an outset, you know, it was a very organic process in, in the way that, you know, Todd had clearly uh, communicated to me this, this sense of authenticity we were seeking, you know, and combining that with a sense of, uh, of observation. So authenticity in my world transfers, you know, to a, a certain style of lighting. And to use uh, one of Todd's phrases, like don't get caught, you know, we never wanted to have a, photographic layer that could separate the the audience from the reception of the images you know so that ruled out certain things you know like a certain bouquet or you know fancy anamorphic lenses you know flashy lighting all that goes out uh, very very you know from the start so when you then go into the concert hall uh, i remember the first um the first visit we, we had and i was still you know getting my my uh kind of my sensibility uh, um, into the right direction. Obviously, as a cinematographer, you first think, oh, yeah, we have to take everything out and then we bring everything in and that's going to be the right thing, which obviously was a complete and would have been insane and was not was not practical. So you start from working with what's there. There's one thing. And there was a very, very crucial directive that Todd gave me is that he always said that the rehearsal space should feel like work. So there shouldn't be any romanticization. Now, as a cinematographer, when you listen to the first bar of the Mahler Symphony, you immediately want to say, you know, you could move the camera. And we were very clear not moving the camera ever. You know, it was a very, that was one of the very, very strong rules. So maybe this translates to something that would feel different, you know, as opposed to how, you know, other films and filmmaker deal with the classical music and people playing instruments. There was a high degree of authenticity and something that is, should feel very real, should feel, feel like work. And I, I always remember that famous scene when Kate runs out uh, and the last the last one to push Elliot Kaplan off the uh, pedestal was, um, you know, Todd said it should really feel like she's coming out the, the, the side pit on a baseball uh, field. You know, that's that should how this should feel. And that's, you know, what we attempted to. I'm so glad you mentioned that shot because I do notice a movement in your camera work between this very intentional idea of control and the way that control um, kind of slips away. And then there's, there's that shot you mentioned where she's coming out and there's something that's so electric. And is is it a handheld shot when she's rushing out onto the stage? Um, you know, that's actually a, a crane that was always crane scripted shot. as such. That was something that Todd had in his mind on the first day that we went to the to the um, uh, concert hall, and it just it was a, a, a bit of a task to <laughs> get this shot really going in this environment. But then it falls into a handheld, of, obviously, and we break that. You know, um, uh, I still, yeah, there was a special day. But it's it was trial by fire because, of course, we had to start with all of that stuff first. Yeah, 
you know and so oh you shot the orchestral stuff first yeah. right yeah so it was really and it, you know there was a really challenging space to to light because obviously it's not you're not just filming an orchestra in the way that Boncarian films which is I mean couldn't be I mean it's the absolute antithesis of the way you two shot this um this particular or orchestra but there were so many characters who need to be picked out within the orchestra they weren't just an amorphous group um there, there were so many responses and reactions and faces that you know had to be sculpted and caught um so it was and and we had so little time and we had we had no time and 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 the very first day with the orchestra given the limited hours that we had with them and Kate had only had two uh, very, very short rehearsals with the orchestra that Florian and I were able to watch um, that were only a couple two, hours. Yeah, long. we had two two-hour blocks, I think. Yeah, that was it. And so we went in there and, you know, um, for the most part, um, Florian was tasked with, uh, you know, with kind of a nightmare, which is that he had to go in and be able to light every single set um, so that we could do anything. And... Um, you know, we didn't, I'm not a big storyboarder, but, but in this case we had to. So Florian and I sat down early on with Natalie Murray Beale, who was our conducting uh, consultant, um, who had already been in conversation with Kate for over a year. And we'd made decisions, um, the three of us about what that music should be and why. And we had a very, very, you know, rich conversation about that. So once that was set, Florian and I sat with Natalie and we went through the score bar by bar by bar, phrase by phrase by phrase. And the very first day we had to do 95 camera setups. Um, and as Florian says, you know, the idea was that you feel like you're either standing in the wings, uh, that's your point of view, or uh, for the most part, or you're a player in the orchestra, which will, that means that that camera has to be at a very particular place when Kate is gesturing towards those players. Um, and we again, we have a very, very short day. Um, you have to give uh, an orchestra breaks um, and you have an hour lunch. So, you know, we went through nine days like that, um, day after day after day. And when we finally got out of there, you know, we were all kind of high fiving and saying, oh, great, you know. And then we had 45 shooting days ahead of us and they weren't <laughs> easy days, you know. So. Um, Kate, I, I really appreciate that you just mentioned Von Karian. If, if a person is carefully listening to Tar, there are mentions of other conductors as well, Dutois and um, uh, obviously Leonard Bernstein. Lawrence right. and Lawrence I wonder if I could just put this to all three of you as generally as I can, which is that um, there is a lineage in the field of conducting of male composers behaving like Lydia Tarr. You, this is a female character. What were your concerns in placing her in this continuity and creating her as a as a female character? Behind that question, uh, are you saying that that that, um, that perhaps there's that people don't want to see a woman behave in a way that's human? I mean, I wonder. I mean, because it's you know, in a way, I mean. Tar is an anagram of a few things, isn't it? One of those things is art. And I think that that works of art are imperfect things. They're always growing and changing and being written and, and written. And once you get to a sense of perfection in art, the thing's dead. Um, and in a way you're watching a character in, um, it's a fairy tale still because there's no woman who's run that, an orchestra of that sort of size and impact um, in, in Europe. and and not only that, not only a female, but an American. And I think that what what you're witnessing, because of the way it's been filmed, too, I, I think you're witnessing somebody who is deeply imperfect, doing sort of inexplicable, um, unforgivable things, unthinking things, un and doing them unconsciously, because she's so focused on the thing in front of her that she has forgotten that there's a kind of an outside world around, which is, I mean, anyone who is in the process of creating something, that can happen, um, you know. And so I think that that is something that is relatable to anyone who's had any passion. And so I, in characters I play always, I think about them as human beings and I think about their gender only when it's, when it's, uh, um, referenced by another character or you know um, the circumstances bring that that person's gender 
into um, presence. And what I loved about the script and what I loved about the film and where I think it is deeply respectful of the fact that women are not a monolith is that it never once references the fact that she's in a same-sex relationship as being um, um, extraordinary. She never once referen um, references the fact that she's a female at the top. It's just that she is a consummate musician and has every right, right to be uh, on the podium. And so therefore, I think in a way, she becomes more than a character, more than simply being female um, in a man's world, which of course we all know to be, you know, that that's the case. And so therefore you can lean into the the, the questions of great, vast moment that the that the um, that the that the uh, film holds. I think, and something I kept I kept holding on to is something that 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 she says to, in the in that Juilliard scene. I mean, talking about a. Uh, a scene that was difficult to to shoot and design and these two were extraordinary there is is um when she says it's always the 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 question that involves the listener it's never the answer and so i was interested in asking a million questions about that person sometimes it was about their gender but but very rarely it was it was the, the questions were beyond that for me anyway yeah, and the film goes beyond that rather quickly because it, like you say, it doesn't focus on gender. It doesn't focus on her her personal relationship. I like that about it. Do you, and and also I really we really have to mention Monica Willey and her work on the editing in in that regard too. Todd, can you perhaps speak to the fact that um, when I'm watching this film, I I I sometimes really resonate with Lydia. Sometimes I find her despicable, uh, and that is a shifting. Um, that's a shifting dynamic during the film. Um, I imagine that was something that you were really um, writing and watching closely yeah. in the edit. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, um, certainly. I mean, Mona, you know, Mona and I had talked about doing something many, many years ago. Um, there were a lot of rules for us. I mean, we were given a great deal of freedom, but for instance, we couldn't have Monica with, with us during the shooting. You know, she was with us at the very beginning for uh, the orchestra uh, stuff. And that was absolutely important where she'd come out and we'd say, did we get it? And she'd say, yes, you got everything, but there was one little note for a trumpet, you know? And it was like, so we knew we could walk away from the day, you know, and, and that we were safe. Um, she was there for when we shot the Juilliard scene. Uh, but other than that, you know, Moan and I um, really only uh, got together properly when we were in Scotland. And there had been another lockdown in London. This was in January of, of last year. Um, and we couldn't cut there. There would have been one in Austria, which, of course, is where Moan is from. We couldn't go there. So we wound up in the middle of, of Scotland, in the countryside, um, with no car, uh, no nothing. And so we edited seven days a week. And we spent a lot of times, you know, walking along the North Sea um, talking about this movie and um, and talking about what it should be and what we should feel about, uh, about this character. Again, to, you know, um, what's fair? You know, uh, how do we not lean one way or the other? And that was a, it was really tricky because, you know, it's, it's a little bit like when you, when you write something, I think it's really important to know when to start. You mustn't start too soon and you mustn't wait too long. Um, but I think it's also, when do you know you're finished? It's like, when, when do you know you're finished with a song or a painting or anything? And, um, and that was really, really, that was a very tough question for us. Um, and the truth is, I don't think we ever finished, you know, I think, I remember the very last day when we knew it was the last day, we, we'd run out of road and we were going to go, you know, show the film to the studio. And I looked at her and she kind of shrugged and I shrugged and we said, okay, well, I guess we're finished. You know, I'm, I'm, we could have kept cutting on this for, for years, you know? Um, so I, I think that that in itself was a confirmation for us, you know, um, that we, it, it was the unanswered question. I, but it's interesting. I often sorry to interrupt, but I often think about this in the theater is that you know you you step on stage for the first preview and you realize the audience is in the auditorium. Now I'm going to really understand what this means. And it felt I don't think I've ever been part of a film before that felt that theatrical in the sense that we we really were so desperate for an audience to tell us how they felt about this thing. 
And so I've been so bowled over by just how passionate and diverse the responses to the film has been. The people have been back who know nothing about classical music, who've been to see it once, twice, three times, you know, to bypass the kind of the being blown back by the film and the, you know, the way the character has been looked at. And, and then they have to sort of try and lean into the emotions and the intellect and then they want to know the references or they start to watch how the film was put together and you know that and so it's been really I, I go you know all the press junkets that one does for it to try and reach an audience I just wanted to ask them questions do you know what I mean well that is the thing I mean that that and that was that was the that was what was so kind of horrifying the first time we showed it to anyone you know the first time we showed it to anyone it was it was you know Peter and Kieske at the studio and and the whole focus team and Mona and I sitting in the back, you know, with white knuckles and to see how they responded to it and, and to see that they just stopped, you know, they, they, they really didn't could, we kept thinking, okay, we're going to get notes. And all they wanted to do was talk about it. And the next day we were supposed to have a screening for somebody to come and help us with the titles, just a single person. And the whole studio showed up. And I said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, we want, we want, we want to see it again, you know? And as Kate says, that, that, um, it's been amazing. That's fantastic. You know, I mean, last night a, a, a young person came up to me who would, I'd seen at another screening and at the other screening, uh, when she was asked, you know, where the audience was asked, how many times you've seen it? This, this young woman said nine times, you know, last night was number 12, <laughs> you know, I think she needs help. <laughs> <laughs> at, at that point what, you, you give the movie to the audience at, and write and then they take it from you and bring it to their place and it becomes a collaboration in a weird way but um absolutely i i do maybe as a final question to all of you and thank you for these thoughtful answers um i wonder what each of you has taken from tar and brought with you into your life after uh, florian i know you actually made lenses for this film manufactured lenses for this film but but kate todd Todd, we've been waiting for another film for you for a while. Is there something specific about Tar that you will take with you into your future work, do you believe? I, I go first because I've got the shortest answer. <laughs> um, I'm going to, you know, the, the the cinema that I've been always been a long fan of Todd's work and his films have been very seminal to me. So uh, when he called, it was obviously a privilege that I, you know, had been waiting for. But I think the cinema that really, you know, drove me to to my love of cinema is the cinema that allows questions like, you know, like Kate just said, like the Antonioni was, you know, when I went to film school. And, you know, when you get into the industry, there's a certain sense sometimes that people think, well, you know, will an audience really go with that? And when I when I was as privileged to take part in this uh, adventure, it was an adventure of a cinema of question. And I you know to me the biggest thing i take with me is that people resonate so strongly with it and that you know we can i can you know the way that todd really cherishes the intelligence of an audience i think that's that's something i will take with me for the rest of my life thank you for the good words so i i feel that I feel this, you know i do feel that way I, I and when i went to film school you know um I didn't go to I, I, the, the films that i was inclined to watch and rewatch and seek out um, allowed room for me, you know, allowed room for me to be the final filmmaker. And I do, I believe that there's a place for that. And I, I believe that's why I started to make films. And that, that was our collective goal with this thing, you know, which was to, to have as many doors as possible for as many people as possible. And, and, and the film, you know, as Kate says, you know, these things, you never know how they're going to work out, but I think based on the response that we've gotten from audiences, um, there's a place for them and there's a place for telling stories in this manner and um and contrary to what you hear in a lot of meetings which you'll actually hear in town you know spoken by people who make decisions they'll say you know the audience is really stupid they're not very bright and i take great umbrage with that it's not true i live in a small town i live with pe around people that are highly educated i live with working class people i live with all manner of human beings and i'm constantly humbled by the insight and the intellect and the knowledge and the sense of engagement that people from all strata uh have the ability to to possess and um and i think that um i think there's always been a time of you know there's always a place for spectacle and 
you know, and and thrill rides and all that. That's all good. I like those movies too, you know. Um, but I think there has to be a place for us uh, for cinema. There has to be a place for us to gather. There has to be a place where, um, you know, our our audiences, um, you know, we lost forty percent of our cinemas, of our specialty cinemas during the pandemic. We need to get them back. I I don't want to live on a television. You know, we did enough of that during the pandemic. And I think there's a place for us to gather and talk and um, and argue as long as we're not indifferent about uh, about cinema. I think that's a that that's what I would take away from this. Kate, are you finding that your creation is living on beyond the shoot? Are people calling oh, yeah. you? Lit, lit? Um, I mean, I'm still unpacking it. And, um, you know, I mean, I one has to accept in a bittersweet kind of way that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I think all of us seized, seized it with our, you know, with both hands and our feet um, in a simian kind of way. <laughs> um, but I, I think what I would take away from it is, I mean, it, it powerfully brought music back into my life. And, um, and also I think a big takeaway for me is these creative relationships, um, you know, which were, were um i mean it was so it was such a buoyant set there was so much it was fun the thrill of it was the thrill of the risk was really i mean what i'll take away and jeanette winston says this fantastic thing i can't remember which novel it's in that what you risk reveals what you value and i think that that is i mean for me that's the t-shirt um you know for for this particular movie because I think we all risked a lot and we every day it was like I don't know this is going to work I don't know oh I don't know uh, and then we just we went on anyway and so I think there's there's some of that dangerous frisson that we all felt when we were making it that that I it's addictive that's very addictive but then I've got to also accept that it may never be replicated but you know at least once <clears throat> With that risk comes comes reward, and it's something I think that we all feel and enjoy with Tar. Congratulations to you all, Kate Blanchett, Florian Hoffmeister, Todd Field. Thank you very much for joining me for this. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.